Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Day for Africa Week event co-hosted by the Africa Research Group and the Urban Violence Network. My name is Lorena Johnson-Prince, and I'm a PhD student with the African Leadership Centre here at King's. My work specifically focuses on the interaction between transnational criminal organisations, communities and the state within a Jamaican context, and it is my pleasure to be chairing this event entitled The World on the Streets, Global Gangsters, Imaginaries and Marginal African Youth. In line with Africa Week's broader theme, this event aims to explore the notion of global blackness expressed in the form of resistance and rebellion on the streets, particularly looking at the limitation of global lens when encountering Pacific local contexts. So we aim to interact with you all. And if you have any questions, please put it in the dedicated Q&A box at the top of the screen and we will come to them after the opening presentations. I will now briefly introduce our amazing speakers and discussants here with us today. Our first speaker, Dr. Ibrahim Abdullah, is an Associate Professor of History and African Studies at Fort Bay College, University of Sierra Leone. He has extensive publications in the area of social change, African social and labor history, and also conflict in West Africa, with his current works focusing on youth cliques in Sierra Leone. He is also a co-investigator with our discussion on two funded gang projects exploring street gangs youth marginalization in Sierra Leone. Our second speaker, Dr. Darius Javansky, is currently a visiting lecturer at the Center of Criminology at the University of Cape Town Faculty of Law. He works as a freelance researcher and he has also carried out extensive research in gangs in Cape Town with its interest in street culture, gangs, urban violence and disengagement. And certainly, Last of all, but not least, is Dr. Kieran Mitten. He is the Senior Lecturer in International Relations with the War Studies Department here at King's, where he is also the co-chair of the Africa Research Group and also the founder of the Urban Violence Network. He also leads two funded research projects exploring gangs and youth marginality in Sierra Leone, the DRC, and the broader African context. So now that I've kind of introduced everyone. I would like Dr. Ibrahim Abdullah to speak first. Again, if you do have any questions, please put it in the Q&A box and I will come to them after. So Dr. Ibrahim Abdullah, if you would take it away, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to join the team to talk about this issue. Um, first of all, I would want to emphasize on the notion of dynamism together with what I call changelessness. Now, this has to be fleshed for me within the context of a black Atlantic on the one hand, and if you like, a white Atlantic on the other, hand, because um, we need to go beyond uh, Gilroy's notion of Black Atlantic, which to us on the continent was more British specific than Atlantic specific. Um, so I want to choose my examples from three areas, Freetown, South Africa, and Jamaica. I am doing that because these are three enclaves that goes back to, if you like, 1500 and 1600 when the Europeans came to Africa. Europeans came to Africa and then connected Africa with the so-called new world. And then we had the modern world as we know it today. Um, Coming to the contemporary period, you begin to see cultural flows. Like for example, you don't, how do you explain the popularity of reggae where I was born and grew up in Frita? I mean, I'm not a Jamaican, but if I meet a Jamaican, I can converse in a reggae, just like somebody who, I mean, 
who grew up with reggae in Jamaica. Now, the point I want to make here is the cultural flows connects one area to the other. And then you begin to make sense of the history. When there are Jamaicans who came here via Nova Scotia to Freetown. But you don't find anybody here today that would say, oh, my ancestry is there. But what the left here is what is important. So that the community that evolved in Freetown, and I would imagine Cape Town, is part and parcel of that black slash white Atlantic that I, I, I want to emphasize. So when historical figures emerge, they don't stay on the stage for long. People come, teams come, they die, they are reborn, and history moves on. So when you look at Jamaica, say around the late 50s, 45, the emergence of the two major parties that are killing Jamaica today, you begin to see that from the ghettos of Kingston, I mean, the subaltern figure that was very much visible was the rude boy, rude boy. If you go to Cape Town, the subaltern figure that was popular, say, before segregation was the Scully. Scully was everywhere. Scully was everywhere. Now, if you switch to the east and go to Johannesburg, you meet a different character, the Saucy. Now, all these are people who you cannot understand outside race. You cannot understand them outside poverty. And you cannot understand them outside illiteracy, etc. These were like the bottom in this society. When it comes to Freetown, we also have our own post-war figure, the Rare Boy, which is not fundamentally different from the character in, in Jamaica or the character in, 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 in Cape Town. But what happens? with globalization. What happened 50 years later was that the rude boy was replaced by the gangster. The scully was replaced by the gangster. And the rare boy was replaced by the gangster. What actually happened? These are three different communities, societies, countries connected historically, but then they have their own internal dynamics that conditions whatever processes are in flow. So you begin to look at what is it that makes Jamaica comparable to Sierra Leone? What is it that makes Sierra Leone comparable to South Africa? And how do we begin to make sense of it? And let's go to the UK. In the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was study boys. Rock and roll, punk, etc. But today, I think those figures, they are still on the stage, but a little bit boxed out. Gangsters are also seemingly taking over. But if you look at the historiography of gangsters, um, Egan Don, etc., they will tell you that look, gangsterism is the age of modernity. Fine. But when you look at the introduction written by Robert Rob Davis in that very book, he tries to trace them back, back to even the 15th century. So where do we place them historically? Because I begin to look at the categories I'm dealing with. And you begin to look at the characters, you begin to look at the context. In the case of Jamaica, it was people, folks in the ghettos that connected the rude boys to the politicians to do their dirty work. That was the link. And it was ganja. Then ganja became cocaine, and cocaine became something else. You see the same link in Cape Town. Now, when you come to Ceylon, you don't see that. You don't see that. We still have ganja. We still have, if you like, hard drugs. But the link in terms of a market that, in a way, fueled the violence with characterized gangsters as a true, you begin to see the internal differences. They are not the same, they are different, but they look very much alike. Why is that so? 
So what are the influences that actually pushes some of the development? Because um, how do marginal youth in Freetown get access to what is happening in LA, to what is happening in New York, or to what is happening in Miami? Of course, most of them will tell you from beginning to end about football, soccer, who makes wars, etc. Because they're always watching them. But the way they reproduce gangster culture is, is difficult, difficult to understand. I mean, of course, they are prepared some of these images for movies, etc. But it's much more deeper than that, because what actually ties them together, in my view, is the general poverty. Because if you look at um, the markers, what actually characterize gangsterism in Kingston, in Cape Town, in Freedom, you begin to see that these are people who mostly come from the bottom. These are people who mostly are school dropouts. These are people who seemingly come from broken homes. And then you begin to make sense of some of those categories. Why would somebody who is a dropout do X in a particular context, and in another context, he or she decides to do Y? So at that point, it, it, it gets complex. But let me just try to end by connecting these categories to what was seemingly a revolutionary option in America. And that is to say, looking at the links between the Black Panther and Creep. Now, don't forget that modern gangsterism, as we know it today, that is the gang gangsterism that is quote unquote black, not the gangsterism of Capone. This is post Capone. Creep, there is a narrative about Creep as an outfit that was put together by the Panthers. And the idea behind Creep was not what it became. The idea was to enter the community and quote unquote, do something for and do something with the underprivileged. That did not happen. It became something else. Now, is it possible that we could begin to make sense of how to get back marginal youths by treading that part, i.e. the part of remaking them as citizens? I don't know. But when I look at the history, when I look at the character that emerged on the stage, I see the link between the rude boy and the gangster in Jamaica. I see the link between the Tsotsi, the Scully in Cape Town and Johannesburg, and the gangsters had living, etc. And I see the link between Rare Boys and the gangs that we have today. It is about marginal youths transcending a particular social category and being reborn as another being. But they are not moving forward. They are still within where they are boxed out. So how do we begin to understand that? And how do we fashion tools to try to stop that or even to try to understand them to the extent to which change from the bottom up will emerge from that interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Ibrahim. I think that was really informed. Um, I know I'll probably have a couple of questions to come back to you during our Q&A session with, but I just want to pass on to Darius now and get him to speak a little bit on his reflections. So Darius, if you would. Great, thanks Lorena and thanks uh, for that Ibrahim. I think my presentation will also 
touch on on some of those sort of aspects of of what you know connects disparate experiences through street culture or global culture or you know gang culture. Um, I will try and keep it short. Oh, I don't know if I can. <laughs> um, but my research generally looks at at street culture and tries to to kind of understand what are the ways that that street culture kind of adapts, right? So not looking at it as something static, but but looking at sort of the edges of it where, where it, it frays a little bit and changes and, and is, is kind of malleable. So looking at how extreme violence kind of changes um, gang norms and expectations on the street, looks, looking at how the participation of women in, in violence um, changes sort of notion of, of masculine street culture, looking at what happens when people break from, from street culture and what sort of cultural resources they access there. And here we'll be looking at sort of this global figure of Tupac Shakur in the context of, of Cape Town and trying to understand, okay, what is sort of the ubiquity of his music and the popularity of his image? What does that mean for, for you know, people's experiences in township areas that are a whole world seemingly removed from, you know, what his life was, right? Um, so just to, to kind of give you a bit of background, I've been researching Cape Town for, for a good five years. Um, and so this particular project is set in the backdrop of that, but it's focused on interviews with 22 specific sort of key informants, all sort of ethnographic stuff. And for those that don't really have a, a sense of what Cape Town is like, you know, the center is quite sort of touristic, affluent, mostly white. Um, and then the township areas where, which are, are kind of called the, the Cape Flats locally, um, is where the most of the, the non-white population lives, um, defined largely by high levels of violence, um, high levels of gang violence. Uh, there's something like 130 gangs that are estimated in the city with 100,000 or, or so gang members. Um, and most of the, the gangs, the ones that are sort of the biggest, the most professional, most notorious, they exist in you know, so-called colored communities. And to, to kind of understand the, the racial dynamics of, of Cape Town, it's I think important to understand what the, the word colored means in the Cape Townian context, because it's obviously much different than, than what it means, you know, sort of in the States, in the UK and, and globally. So the term colored is, is typically or historically used as sort of a, a social category to classify people of mixed race. And then eventually it was codified through apartheid and existed as one of four racial categories. And this has survived apartheid and now you know, people who, who are colored for the most part self-identify as such. So it's a commonly accepted term, although it is still like contested amongst some. So when I use it, that's kind of the context that I use it in. Um, one that, that, you know, is embedded in history of, of colonialism, of cultural erasure and continued marginalization in the present day. And so apartheid has ended, but people that, that live in the townships, both colored and black people, um, you know, live still in mostly monoracial communities, um, largely segregated from sort of the opportunity and affluence of, of central Cape Town. And so, you know, the, the same conditions which Ibrahim pointed to, poverty, um, lack of basic services, lack of access to policing, lack of access to justice, are very much the same things that, that drive gangsterism um, and to a lesser extent sort of like cliques and crews. So gangsterism in colored communities and then cliques and crews in in black communities. And so, as I said, what I'll be looking at is, is colored communities and, and their experiences sort of with how Tupac is, is perceived and, and kind of how he's understood as, as a cultural resource. Um, you know, it's interesting, as I said, like here's a rapper who was born and lived in the States, died in the States, um, and then 25 years almost after his death, you know, his music is still ubiquitous. Like you go on the, the Cape Flats and you've got these like small speakers that people are playing music on and, and more often than not, you'll hear a Tupac song, right? I mean, where there's so many other contemporary artists that they could be playing or other, you know, artists from the golden era of hip hop and, and he's the one that survives, right? Um, I used to, to have a CD player in my car before I upgraded and one of the, I had the, the double disc of All Eyes on Me and eventually I just had to get rid of it because Everybody that was in my car always wanted to hear that particular, you know, those, th those two particular discs. So it's like, it really is everywhere. And songs like Hit em Up are, are like widely known. And so, yeah, what, what, what does this tell us, right? About, about street culture and the way that culture is sourced from non-local sources and adapted to, to the local context. And so 
as I said, the sort of the the frame through which I see this is is through the street cultural lens. So generally, um, street cultural writings are focused on the way that that poverty and exclusion um, from mainstream sort of opportunities create a, an intense competition that's kind of manifested in aggression, in um, sort of hypersensitivity, in violence and conflict. And these things are used as a competitive advantage to, you know, to get respect, to get power, to get access to material resources. Obviously not by everybody, but for, for those that use it, like it's, it's something that shapes people's sense of, of, you know, how it is to be successful in a community largely, even for those that, that aren't in a gang or aren't involved in, in street culture. Um, you'll see that they take on some of these poses, you know, not necessarily even acting violently, but adopting street styles that are associated with, you know, the gangsters that they see on the corner. And so speaking here, for example, in Cape Town in a prison language known as Sabella, which used to be quite secretive, but now is kind of an indication of like in group status with the gang. And so people that are not gang members will also learn this and, and adopt it to a certain extent. Um, yeah, styles of clothing, sort of their knowledge of, of what's going on in the neighborhood in terms of, of you know, who's doing what. Um, all of these things are, are so-called sort of street capital, which kind of exists in contrast to, to um, the notion of cultural capital, which is a, a notion of um, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, which kind of talks about like the, the knowledge and the, the skills and sort of the cultural reference and things that you acquire by being in mainstream society, right? And so for those that, that don't have access to that, turn to, to street culture. And so typically street culture is seen as something that's adaptive, that's driven by agency in reaction to, to structural oppression. But despite this, often street cultural writings I mean, they focus on, on, on reproduction of, of, of social oppression and they do so in, in a way that, that you know, makes sense because they kind of get away from, if you, if you connect these things that I'm talking about like violence and aggression and gang activity to, to structural marginalization, then you get away from sort of pathologized understandings of like why people join gangs, why people are violent, but you know, it's, it's an, a self-destructive act. I, Ultimately, it's something that, that people seek agency through, but you know, they'll sell drugs to their own community, they'll kill each other. Um, and so in writings about street culture, often it's, it's sort of presented as, as you know, something that locks people in. And it's like, it, it's almost like despondent in a way. And so what makes me interested about the way that culture is adapted is that it gives us, you know, not necessarily like a clear out, but at least sort of the beginnings of, of where change and transformation are able to, to take place. And so that's the kind of the things that, that I'm gonna try and explore through the examples that I give um, in, in what I'm talking about here about Tupac. So without uh, going on for too long, let me, let me get into to the actual sort of meat of the, the presentation. So I want people to, to kind of understand that, that what I'm presenting aren't necessarily archetypes. What I'm more interested in, in, in terms of, of you know, what I looked at, um, Tupac's presence as, as a global um, oppositional repertoire is not exactly, you know, this is the way that people use it, but trends and mechanisms and sort of like processes which vary from individual to individual, but you can see little bits and pieces of them from the examples that I'm going to be talking about. So the first one is, is kind of the most obvious one and the one that I expected when I, I you know, started this research is this idea that like men, especially men that are in gangs or sort of gang adjacent, um, connect with, with that aspect of, of Tupac's music as like the gangster rapper, you know, especially sort of later on in his career, All Eyes on Me when he signed with Death Row and then like his posthumous stuff as well. Um, it, it connects to what uh, one of the, the Cape Tonian gang research here called an outlaw masculinity. And so he spoke to a number of youth in a um, a youth correctional facility, and they specifically mentioned Tupac and, and kind of um, his um, identity being an extension of a vision of manhood that valorizes crime, wealth, spending time in prison. And these are very much the things that sort of characterize the mythologies of, of the criminal elite on the Cape Flats, right? And so you'll, for example, if, if I'm speaking to a gang member and asking them about, 
um, about what Tupac represents to them. You know, I've, I've heard stories where people will be listening to his music, obviously not exclusively, but you know, his numbers in particular, smoking meth in preparation for a gang hit. Um, I had another conversation with a member or a former member actually of the Mongrels. And he said that, you know, they would watch, I, I don't know what movie it was, but one of his movies and, you know, the way he shot a gun is sort of like that stereotypical sideways way of shooting that's associated with like American gangster films. And so they started doing that, you know, say we're, we're not going to shoot the proper way anymore because this is the way that Tupac does it. And probably the most obvious way is that in a number of instances, young men have actually taken on sort of the moniker Tupac and embodied him sort of, you know, physically say, okay, I'm going to change my name or at least my nickname to Tupac. And, you know, in fact, I've, I've met a number of, of these individuals, one who I knew quite well, in fact, and um, I, I never actually knew his real name. And the sad thing about sort of my personal interaction with him, but I mean, you know, the way that his life mimicked the, the life of Tupac is that six months after I met him, he was stabbed to death and he was a member of, of the Americans, right? And so, you know, this is kind of the, the most obvious and, and saddest, I guess, um, kind of connection and, and representation of, of what we would expect with, with that sort of, um, let's say, subcultural repertoire, oppositional repertoire. Um, but, you know, that's not to, to say this is the only way that, that it can be perceived. So, for example, females connect with Tupac's music in different ways, despite the fact that, you know, there's a misogyny embedded in, in a lot of his music, although, you know, he has songs like Keep Your Head Up and Dear Mama and Brenda's Got a Baby that are much more sort of empowering. Um, women will look at, at some of his, his music and, and use it as motivation. And one really sort of interesting case study was, I mean, much like the, the Tupac that I mentioned previously, was a young woman um, in, in one of the township communities who also changed her name to Tupac. Now, this isn't something that, that I've seen outside of that isolated incident, but like the way that she used his repertoire, I think is really, really interesting. And it dovetails the way that other women connected to aspects of sort of his music and his legacy. So she said that, you know, at the age of 14, she started calling herself Tupac. She was listening to his numbers, to, to his songs. And, and, you know, she felt really empowered by, by what she heard. Um, and she was living in a domestic situation where she was being abused. You know, she was living in a, in a dangerous community. She actually went so far as to, to shave her head, get a nose ring, sort of a, a piercing. Um, she called it a diamond that, you know, a stud like Tupac had, wear the bandana backwards. And people started to, to call her Tupac, right? And she started to, to kind of roll with the, the local gang, which was the 26s, gain some respect in the community. And she said that this made her head swell and she felt like a superstar. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it was an interesting fusion of, of something that, that you wouldn't expect, right? And it was an indication of the way that young women can also look to what are seemingly sort of masculine representations of power and respect and appropriate those to their own circumstances, seeking a lot of the same things that men do by doing that, right? Power, respect, protection. Um, as well as trying to distance themselves from things that only they will experience like gendered violence, which is, you know, at high rates in, in South Africa. Um, so I've done other research that looks specifically at how women connect to street culture and sort of the mechanisms by which they, they use street cultural repertoires um, and, you know, why they engage in gangs and violence. And more than trying to be a man, they talk about trying to represent the symbols of success, you know, the embodiments of success around them um, and connecting to, to them in, same, in the same way, as I said, as, as men do. So it gives us kind of a, a different notion of, of why people, both men and women connect to street culture, not as like a, you know, a one dimensional kind of view of, of violent masculinity, but as a reaction to, to oppression, which is experienced similarly, but differently. Um, and so moving away from sort of direct, uh, connections to street culture. I came across a number of instances where people used Tupac's imagery and his legacy and, and sort of listened to his songs as a motivation to get away from gangs or get away from substance or to cope with problems at home. And so I, I met uh, another man who, whose name was, who took on the nickname Tupac. And he only did so um, after going to prison. So he was a hitman for a gang that used to exist as the Backstreets and uh, was known kind of as the ghettos 
more or less has morphed into into that particular sort of yeah anyway that's not so important but um this this guy went to to prison for for murder um he joined the 26s which is a prison gang and then became like infatuated with tupac and what he said was that tupac helped him make sense of his life and his struggle and actually gave him sort of the power to leave the prison gang which is incredibly difficult to do because you know this is a gang that you join in order to seek protection some selfish some sense of assurance that that you won't be violated in prison and so it was a, a real sort of positive resource um and then when he got out you know he he, he got a, a tattoo he got an outlaw tattoo on his forearm he got thug life on his stomach in the same way that that tupac did and you know in the same way that that the woman previously had like transformed herself into tupac he did in his own way um and he also spoke about as other people did kind of the the substance of, of tupac's music so not just him as a street soldier but him as what people referred to as a ghetto prophet saying that there's ghettos in america ghettos in africa people living similar experiences um referencing the struggle um for for some sort of cultural identity that was erased for colored people during apartheid and this being a resource that allows you to to feel empowered and connects you to sort of similar struggles um, by racialized or people of color um, in, in in other areas and so i'll give one last example that kind of works through in in a, a fluid way some of these some of the things that i've, I've talked about and so it, it deals with um one last sort of character and Tupac for, for this person has meant different things at different times. So he started off as a gangster. Um, he was kind of brought into to the gang, the mongrels by his brother who was also a mongrel. Um, the, the situation of this particular key informant in, in, at, at that time in his youth, he was living in an informal settlement, um, was quite dangerous. And you know he was being abused by his father, and his brother came in, and he was kind of this this you know figure that that provided for the family, that protected him to a certain extent, and exemplified you know what status and success is. And his brother was also infatuated with Tupac, so he tells of this one story about how they used to to watch the video "Do for Love," which is an animated video. And at this point, he was a young boy, and he only spoke Afrikaans. So he didn't actually have a sense of, of what the video was about. All that he saw was his brother and the other mongrels connecting to, to this particular video. And he thought that Tupac was a cartoon. And then later as he, so like you see sort of the process of socialization and identification and how it merges between gang culture and, and sort of you know, global street culture. And then later he, he also became infatuated with Tupac saying that he looked up to the rappers but Tupac in particular, because they spoke of, of similar things um, they were experiencing in, in, you know, in the informal settlement that he lived in and in some of the other township communities that his family was in and that he visited. Um, and so Tupac and, and sort of Tupac's proximity to, to the gang and specifically this key informant's brother was an entry point into gangs, right? And then something that sort of exacerbated his, his participation in gang culture. And so he ended up going to prison for murder. Um, and during that process, started a, a transition to, to get out of, well, he joined a prison gang, but to, to get out of the prison gangs, to get out of the, the mongrel street gang. And he talks about how one of the, there was two resources that he was allowed to have sort of in his cell, which is a shared cell, but like in his part of it. And one was a Tupac poster and the other one was a Bible. You know, two sort of social resources that are available in, in a situation where you 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 don't have much in, in in terms of social resources and you know in fact religion is um a huge sort of um a, a sense of it provides a sense of community it provides a um also a repertoire to to buy into for people that are trying to get out of gangs and so these two two sort of social resources were were kind of positioned together as a, a way of of him leaving gangs and so as he got out of prison, as he, he tried to get out of the gang, you know, people started to perceive him as being weak. And so he was beaten up a number of times. He was shot at and almost killed. And so, you know, it takes a, a great amount of perseverance in order to, to, to get through something like that without sort of regressing back into to your former lifestyle, where your power is, where your protection is. And for him, 
he wanted to be a rapper. He decided in prison that, that he wanted to be like Tupac. He wanted to, in his words, be an inspiration for kids at the Cape Flats. And so he had this sort of vision of what his life could be like. And it was embodied in what he understood, you know, through the prism of, of Tupac's music and his sort of sense of identity and, and these sorts of things. And like not to reduce his particular struggle to, to some notion of grit, because it obviously isn't that, but it was a signpost that, that he could point to as he kind of moved to, to get out of gangs. So those are the, the four examples that I'll present. And I think what's important to, to kind of draw out of that is the different ways that, that people are able to adapt seemingly, you know, similar cultural resources, right? So from the, the kind of expected and almost like stereotypical notion of the gangster rapper, you know, which like, polite society loves to, to clutch its pearls about to something that, that you know, is available to, to females in the same way that it is to, to males, to something that is, is available to those that are trying to not just leave gangs, but also avoid them or deal with substance problems or um, other problems at home. And so, yeah, I think this gives us a sense that, that street culture and cultural in, in general isn't just something that's sourced locally it's sourced internationally as well or globally and people connected in, to it in similar but different ways. I mean, I've seen research that, that speaks about the prominence of Tupac's imagery amongst um, youth or child soldiers perhaps um, in the context of the Sierra Leonean civil conflict. And there's also been sort of documented cases of people identifying with, I mean, rappers in general, but, but Tupac in specific in you know, the context obviously of the United States in different ways in Europe, across the African continent. And I think touching back on, on something that Ibrahim had said is, is you know, that the through point here is people's experiences with marginalization and oppression and the way that they adapt the resources that are available to them in order to find coping mechanisms, find a sense of agency. Um, and, you know, they can do that in, in ways that are, are surprising sometimes, right? And so again, not to, to kind of, um, almost valorize this idea of like grit and coping and resilience um, because you know you can have a, a signpost that looks towards the future and, and a coping mechanism and it'll only take you so far most of the people that I interviewed in fact all of them are still living in township communities a lot of them in in you know pretty desperate conditions and so you know without the structural changes that these sort of subcultural and cultural coping mechanisms are connecting to, you know, you're not going to get real social transformation. You're going to get, you know, just a, a sort of like disparate attempt to, to cope with, with difficult circumstances. Um, I, I mean, I'll end it off on a, a quote as problematic as he is um, from, from T.I. Who, who was being interviewed, I think by Trevor Noah, and they were talking about violence and, and hip hop. And he, he made the, the point, he's like, well, if you want the music to change, the environment that produces it has to change. Not to say that all hip hop is produced by this sort of environment, but I, I thought that it was a resonant point and kind of speaks to, to what I'm trying to get across between sort of cultural adaptation and, and structural oppression and the linkage between those two. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Darius. Um, I think I'll have questions for you as well. <laughs> um, I'd like to quickly go to Kieran just to get some of his points or comments on what he's just heard, if that's okay. Thank you, Lorena. Um, I've decided I'm not gonna wrap my comments. I'm just gonna keep it professional. Um, Ibrahim, thank you so much. I, I, it was really, was really interesting and thought provoking. Um, I think there's a good contrast between the two of you, what you focused on. I mean, with Ibrahim, you gave us like a really great comparative lens and a historical overview as well. Um, the balance is those two really key points you mentioned about the dynamism and changelessness um, or kind of, you know, continuities and change. And Darius, you gave us a really granular kind of level at the individual level talking about um, some of the influences that Ibrahim's talking about. So I just, a lot of the stuff I just found fascinating. I mean, we talked in the event description about the local and the global. Um, and, you know, um, Ibrahim, you mentioned about the Jamaican influence being around when you grew up in Freetown. And I find it, as you know, I find it really interesting today being in Freetown and still 
Lorena, you might, you might find this interesting, different areas, um, the lower sides are called Gully and the higher sides are called Gaza, based off what, what has been happening in Kingston. And the dance hall is so popular and you see it, it's not just a historical thing, the influence of, 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 of reggae and rap and dance hall is still really, really strong. And, you know, perhaps it's even grown um, given the internet and, and access to great information. Um, so I think Ibrahim, it's really interesting the way that you, you see the kind of these global influences or these historical influences, but also the importance of local context. And you pointed out some key differences, um, for example, about, you know, unlike what Darius was talking about in the context of Cape Town, where you have this quite violent um, disputes over drugs and, and, and the drugs trade, that's not really the case in Sierra Leone or in Freetown. So they're not the same, but they look the same is, is, is the kind of point you made. And you asked, why is that so? And the, the key point that Ibrahim made, which you know, I, I you know I agree with, was for the most part, what unites all of these different cases is that general poverty and marginalization. That's the common thread. Um, and then you asked the key point, Ibrahim, which I might ask you to comment on when we when we come back to you. Um, you said in some situations people do X and not Y, and then in other cases they do Y. And if Y is behave well and X is join a gang and, and cause trouble. That's the key question, isn't it? Because then it links to the next point that you're asking is how do we help people get out of these situations? And I know it's a really difficult question to narrow in on an individual level, but I wonder in some situations, in some contexts, like in Cape Town or in Freetown, are there broader conditions that make people more likely to do X if X is joining a gang when faced with marginalization? Whereas in other countries where you still have marginalization, you still have poverty, there are conditions that prevent that. And I don't know what that is. So <laughs> I'm basically asking you to solve the problem of youth marginalization and gang violence. Um, so if you can, if you can do that, I'll be, I'll be quite impressed. Um, Darius, you, the, the, the thing that's interesting about contrasting Cape Town and Freetown and from, from even introduction are some of those key differences. And you mentioned the racial dynamics um, you mentioned the drug trade, and you also mentioned the intensity of violence. It's very, very different to, to Freetown, for a lot of people in Freetown would argue there aren't even gangs, and that's been one of the challenges of Abraham's work, is getting people to acknowledge the importance of, of, of the cliques. Um, but I, I, I would like to pose the same question to you about the marginalization and poverty. Do you feel like the situation in Cape Town is perhaps more intense than it is in places like Freetown, or even where I'm here in London? because of the drug trade, um, because of the historical legacies of apartheid um, and, and, and that quite specific set of conditions that you don't have in, in Freetown and that you don't have in, in, in Kingston where Lorena works. Um, and then I'll, I'll rush through the last couple of points because I really don't want to hear from me, I want to hear from you. Um, the, the role of gender was something that I was going to ask about. So it's you know, great that you brought that up. I was just wondering, Ibrahim, um, and again, it's something I know we've talked about but I'll be interested in, in, in hearing more about what you think about the role of, of, of women in, in this gangster thing in Sierra Leone, which is a relatively new thing. Um, they're not as visible, but they're there. And I'm wondering if you see part of the appeal for them being to kind of, as Darius said, it's not necessarily about being like men, it's about being maybe accessing a degree of empowerment. Is that what you think it might be in Freetown or is it something else that draws women into the gangs? Is it just about the same kind of conditions of marginality? Um, and Darius, Darius, you said, um, I guess two questions for you. On, on, on the study of the Sierra Leone Civil War, there were a lot of people, people like Paul Richards were talking a lot about Rambo and, and the influence of these figures. And then I had friends who were saying, weren't we all interested in this stuff? Aren't, aren't we all Tupac fans? <laughs> Um, so why, why do we pay so much more attention to it in these contexts? And I'm sure there are good reasons. So I just wonder if you can explain why it's, why it's important to focus on that and not all of their other interests that they also have in common, you know, or is it really much more pronounced than say in my school playground where there were definitely kids who, who went around for a while calling themselves Tupac. Um, and then on the, the TI quote, which was a really great quote about, you know, if you don't want violence in, in kind of rap and gangster rap, then you need to change the conditions in which it's made. But is there anything to it? Is there anything to the argument that the influence of whether it's US inspired or, or Jamaican dance hall or anything else, that it does create oppositional um, ideologies 
about intergang fighting. You know, it's not just about, you know, this empowering symbol of resistance and standing for yourself. It is about shooting other gangsters. Um, and that's just playing devil's advocate there. Um, so I think, Lorena, you'll have some, some questions as well. So um, thank you both again. I thought that was fascinating. And I'm just going to shut up now. Thank you, Kieran. I think I'm going to give Ibrahim and Darius a chance to respond first before I give my comments. Also, if anyone has any questions, please do drop it in the Q&A box and I will actually get to them as well. So you can have your opportunity to ask some questions. But I think I'll go to Ibrahim first for his response and then we'll go to Darius. Well, I... <laughs> I don't know. What were the questions again? Because <laughs> you seem to have answered your own question about marginality. I mean, um, let me just try to make sense of what uh, uh, Darius was saying about Tupac, because Tupac has actually brought, I mean, to these gangsters, he has kind of, you see, before when the Rare boys were on the scene, just like in Jamaica, they were connected to politicians and they were the ones who did the dirty work with elections, the ballot box, etc., etc. Then the word thug, T H U G, got introduced into the Creole language. And it was really an insult for somebody to call you a thug. People fought each other because somebody called somebody a thug. Now, when Tupac entered the scene, Tupac remade Thug. Because, I mean, if you go to McKinney, there is a McKinney Thug. There is a, a McKinney Hood Thug or something like that. In other words, he valorized what people were running away from. Because Tupac called himself a Thug. And people said, look. If Tupac, this is somebody who dropped out of school and became somebody. This is somebody who came out from a single parent home and became somebody. Now, if Tupac has made it and he's calling himself a thug, then I'm a thug. So the whole notion of you've been boxed out, you've been kicked out, and here is somebody you admire appropriating that thing that you did not want to touch it begins to quote unquote cleanse the idea that you couldn't do certain things, you know. So in other words, Tupac was valorizing violence. He was valorizing thugway. And he was saying that, look, if the door is shut there, there's another way. And if there's another way, you can be yourself. And this attracted combatants who were fighting, I think, Tupac is the only image that combatants took away from the wall. And that is the image that gangsters took away from combatants. It's still alive. You know, it, it, it's not dying, it's not going away. Just like there is a saying, every ghetto you go to, you'll see Tupac. Tupac is there. I have interviewed more than a thousand gangsters in this country. And I could tell you that every ghetto I went to, there has to be a Tupac. It's a name, if, if it's not Tupac, it's Shakur. But the both names are, you know, so that begins to tell you, hey, if this is something that young men are appropriating. So it's not about the mainstream anymore. It's about you're making it, there's another way of making it. He has made it, they wanted him out, but he brought himself in. So why not? I'm down with Tupac. Um, that's all I can say. Um, what uh, uh, Karen is trying to say, I can't answer it. You know, I can't end marginality. What our analysis can do is to show them the conditions under which marginality emerges. Now, why A will do B in a particular context and C will do F in a particular context is something that has to be teased out locally. No two conditions are the same. So we begin to understand that. I mean, take the, take the Nigerian example, for example, here. Here we are seeing, in the case of Sahel and Cape Town, we are seeing youths in ghettos 
getting involved in drugs, etc., and making things totally bad in the township or in the hood. Now in Nigeria, what is happening is that it is college students that are appropriating these ideas and taking it back to the hood. How do you explain it? You are dealing with two different categories of agents here. An agent that is supposedly mainstream, becoming something else. And then an agent who is supposedly boxed out, trying to come in. So the ins and outs, the complex context, it begins to make you ask questions like, so what do we do? What do we do? How do we take back the street from this guy? You know, because don't ever think that walking to school or driving to school, you are safe. No, because the gangs are in schools. They are in schools. Every school, every high school has three or four sets, teams there. So when kids fight in school, it's not about grade or something. It's about the flag either blue, red, or black. So it begins to tell you, where is it? Where is the street now? Is it the physical street or is it the school? So it's, it's, it's everywhere. And if every team, every set in a particular area begins to control an area and not allowing others to come in, then you are talking about a situation where people are owning and claiming space that is running against what the state should be doing. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ibrahim. Um, Darius, I don't know if you want to touch on some of what Kieran has spoken about before I give my comments. I also don't remember the questions. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, th this question of you know, essentially, Kieran's question to, to Ibrahim was, was, you know, solve for X, right? I mean, to, to kind of like put it facetiously, um, but it, it assumes a direct sort of line between marginality and, and violence or, or gangsterism or, or street culture, whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, and that just doesn't exist. I mean, the, the case of Cape Town is really, really interesting because there's been so much gang research done here. I mean, and like, not only is it representing sort of the continent in a way, because like people say, I, you know, you talk about gangs in Africa, you go to Cape Town, but colored gangs in Cape Town aren't representative, obviously, of what's going on in Freetown, nor Nigeria, nor Nairobi, you know, nor any other country. And they're actually not representative of what's going on in this country, right? Like they're a locally based phenomenon um, that's actually quite different in if we look at black communities in Cape Town itself, you don't get the same level of organization. You get higher levels of violence, but it's not gang violence, it's interpersonal violence. Um, so not in all communities, but, but in some communities. When you look at like the top 10, often it's not predominantly colored communities that, that are in that top 10, or at least like they're in the top 10, but they're maybe not you know, representative of like the, the top three. And so, Black communities generally have lower level of basic services, um, higher levels of poverty at the household level. And so, you know, you would expect for, for if this direct line between marginalization and violence and gangsterism held, then you would see higher levels of gang violence in those communities. And you may have higher levels of different types of violence, but it's, it's manifested differently, right? And nobody's really been able to explain why that is. Like I've, I, I, I've, I've spoken to, to people that are in cliques and crews in, in black communities. And often what they point to is sort of the differences in culture. So sort of um, more well-developed and preserved um, family sort of like clan structures that create a, a sense of social cohesion that one curtail the, the use of violence and two presumably to some extent the growth of, of gangs themselves as organizations um, and the fact that you know so much of, of what is been used to explain the the predominance of, of gangs and especially like big organized gangs in colored communities is social disorganization that was created during like the forced re removals in, in Cape Town and how that 
broke apart social cohesion and family networks and all of those sort of like, you know, social safety mechanisms that, that can curtail violence and the, the growth of these groups. And you know, gangs are a way of, of trying to, to supplement some of this, right? To create a sense of identity when your culture has been destroyed, to create a sense of family when, when that family unit has been torn apart and scattered through uh, different parts of, of the city sort of willy nilly. Um, and so, you know, these are, are some of the, the explanations that are given um, in terms of like the comparative analysis of, of cliques and crews, one in, in black communities in Cape Town, and then, you know, organized street gangs in colored communities. And I think, you know, it's, it's actually a really interesting question and it speaks to, to some of those other sort of cultural influences as, as well as like other influences that I couldn't even begin to guess at because I haven't done much research in, in, in black communities. Um, but at the very least it points to, you know, as a starting point for understanding how to tackle um, sort of the gang problem, if you want to call it that, is not to define it as a sort of ubiquitous and standard gang problem, right? It is a manifestation of people's desire to cope with their sort of limited circumstances um, and the oppressions and the different marginalities that they face. And the way that they do that will vary, you know, depending on community, depending on, on ethnicity, depending on, on you know, country. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the thing that I was trying to get across, and it speaks to, to um, I guess one of the questions that you asked vis-a-vis -vis the, the TI quote, um, you know, street culture and the influence of, of let's say hip hop, if, if we're just gonna limit it to that as like a, a nefarious sort of force isn't, you know, it, it doesn't hold, right? It's not one thing. I think what, what I tried to show through my research is the nuance of, of how a singular sort of symbol or person that is like, fragmented and refracted in different ways can be perceived differently by different people, right? So, you know, even thug life is, is something that is, is different things to different people. Like when Tupac was talking about thug life early on in his career, he was speaking to it not being necessarily a violent thing, but, but rooting for the underdog, right? And so sort of this, again, it, capturing it sort of like opposition writ large. Um, also speaking about how it's not a thing by a, but a diagnosis. He didn't create it, but, but diagnosed what thug life is because it's a reaction to society's ills. And then later on, it morphed into something that was more, you know, based in, in like violence and profligacy and, and all of those things that we associate with like the quote unquote gangster rapper, right? So it can be a bad influence, right? It, it can sort of morph with, with circumstance um, and, the gangs that exist and, and gang culture of a particular area, but it doesn't need to, and it doesn't even need to for, for one particular person as we saw sort of in, in the last case that I presented, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, to, to speak to your second question, you know, I, I think people resonate with, with international symbols in different ways. Like I'm a hip hop fan, right? I will listen to the song Hit Em Up because the song has got an amazing energy and part of that is based in the aggression that it expresses, but I have a whole different set of sort of socializing um, and structural, uh, I don't know what circumstances that I'm presented with, right? And so one, nobody would think to study me because it'd be super boring. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and some level, like I, I am influenced in, in similar ways. And, you know, especially when I was younger and, you know, it, it isn't, um, limited to, to hip hop, it's, you know, I watched all sorts of gangster movies. I, I, I love like the, the throwback gangster movie, like Goodfellas and, and, you know, The Godfather, and then all the way up through to like Menace and Boys in the Hood and all of that stuff. And, and you know, there, there was a part of that that I think you identify with as an adolescent seeking to, to sort of push the boundaries of your adolescent space and find your identity. It's just that you know, the boundaries that we push um, in areas that are affluent, that are generally safe, are different than the boundaries that, that adolescents push in an area, you know, like the Cape Flats, right? The, the risk and sort of the, the tipping point in your life, you know, the, the, the potential to get into danger that you can't get back from is, is just, you know, 
infinitely greater, obviously. Like I, I did some, some rather shady things as a kid, but it was like all idle hand stuff, right? It's, it, it wasn't something that, that ever pushed me past that tipping point where, you know, I had the privilege of, of a family that was relatively well off and, and, you know, all these support mechanisms and the benefit of the doubt that society gave me, whereas that doesn't exist, right? So the influences are there, but again, like the, 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 the structural um, circumstances are obviously different. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Dareth. I can see two questions currently in the Q&A box, but I just wanna briefly give my comments before we get to those. I found both very interesting. I mean, for me, with my research mainly focusing on Jamaica, it's really ironic talking about youth in a sense, because my work doesn't really focus on that element, but in kind of doing some of my research, it has touched upon elements of youth. And from talking to participants, um, we've I've got understandings from a lot of them in which they say that music is Jamaica's superpower. So youth are going to align to that. They're going to see that that's the road to success because that's the success story that they see. So even in understanding that, it's also about understanding what motivates youth, what makes them want to succeed, what, what makes them or drives them to do better and be successful. And what narratives do they see of success? What, are, what is their understanding of success in that sense as well? Because even to understand that is to understand that whole region and margin and relaxation in that sense. Also, it's, I think you touched a bit on it, Darius, in terms of the influence. Who do you exchange their influence with in that sense as well? Who is actually influencing them in that sense as well? What kind of social power is at that basis? Who, who do they find likable? Who do they feel like they connect with more on a local social level? So I think it's really important discussions to be actually having at this moment also even looking at it from a leadership perspective who is mutually beneficial to them in that sense as well when looking at these gangster leaders is it that actually i share a mutual bond with you i i actually understand you because i see our past interconnecting as such so i think even in understanding that it's also good to look at that kind of area in terms of leadership, who is emerging as a leader in that sense, especially in the communities, is it the dons that are emerging as the leaders? And in that sense, is that why youth are looking up to them instead of other kinds of themes or that kind of sense? But I think those are my general comments. Also in terms of Jamaica, just touching on the gendered element as well, it's really ironic. I think I spoke to a really influential blogger while I was doing my research and they actually pointed out that 70% of the workforce is women. So when you look at men or young boys who are influencing them and what influences do they see? It's a, it's a different kind of level to break that down as well, looking at it from a gendered element. So I really, enjoyed hearing you speak and I don't know uh, there's not many questions but you might want to comment on what I've just commented on as well and give some pointers but I think that's my general kind of gauge from our discussion and then once you respond to that I'll go to the Q&A's. Yeah I think uh, the question you raised about who they see I think it's it's key because um to put it in another way, why would young men, why would adolescent boys decide not to play by the rules? Why would they valorize, I mean, the non-mainstream? Why? Because they've seen people tread that path and quote unquote are successful. So um, for you, the state or the official, or whosoever, or even parents, assuming there are two parents at home, to convince the kid, otherwise it's tough. 
it's tough. Because when you begin to think that depending on the neighborhood, depending on the city, that kid begins to spend more time with folks outside than inside the house. How do you begin to, to turn them around? It's a tough one. You know, because, I mean, today, 60% of young men in the city of Freetown, they are attached to soccer in a religious way. I mean, when you begin to see them crowded in rickety shacks, watching Brazil or watching Manchester United and Liverpool, you begin to ask yourself, are these kids really in Freetown or are they in Birmingham? So they are tuned to things that we can control outside, outside our powers. So how do you begin to get them back? You know, now when you flip that and you look at a kid with both parents at home, he or she will sit in the living room and watch the same soccer. So the contexts are different and the influences have to be ipso facto different. So from the domestic level to the streets, negotiating that pathway or what Elijah Amnesty would call the courts of the street, it becomes very, very complex. I did it as a kid, but things were not so bad. No. And for example, when state officials walk out, say in certain neighborhoods in the UK or in the US, when they see white kids, it doesn't immediately click to them that these kids could be gangsters. But if they are black, automatically they are. These are issues that you begin to think about. In certain contexts, if you, they see black, and, black kids and white kids, they assume that they are gangsters. And then look at what is happening in Nigeria. Now the police see you with an iPhone or an iWatch. They think you are a gangster. They think you are an arm robber. And they think that you are a cheat. So there are certain things that go with certain people in certain contexts that makes the law begins to think otherwise. Um, it's complex. It's not the same everywhere, but they are beginning. To, this, this, these experiences are beginning to speak to things that we all should be concerned with. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I just want to dig into some of these Q&A questions right now. And the first one that I can see is what information, if any, do you have on the mental health issues among gang members and whether there's a stigma and how mental health issues are treated by their fellow gangsters? If there is anything you can comment on that. And I think another question just to put two out there is do either of you see gang social service provisions in marginalized communities like Black Panthers? And I think if we leave it at those two for now and then I can come back and do another two, that would be great. I mean, I don't know if you guys have any comments for that, but I'll see. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I only have anecdotal some evidence to, to offer um, for, for, I guess, each of those. But, you know, mental health issues are the type of issues that, that you would sort of expect. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I would, I have seen those being sort of treated even informally or dealt with um, by sort of gang members themselves. But I think one of the things that that street culture generally valorizes is this, you know, sense of, of like being fearless and being brave and, and you know, risk taking. And in, in fact, something that, that a few of the, the key informants in this particular study pointed to is that, you know, Tupac died and he knew he was gonna die because he sang about it in his songs. But in the meantime, he had cars and jewelry and money and all of these things. And I knew that I'm also gonna die and I've got all of these things. And so I'm going to enjoy it while I can, you know, that is a type of coping mechanism. I'm not sure it's a healthy coping mechanism, but it's a way of understanding that, you know, death is something that is around me because, you know, 
even researching here for, for a number of years, you kind of learn to make your peace with, with people that, that get killed on a regular basis, right? And this is for me that, that doesn't live in the community, isn't connected to, to the families um, in the same way, obviously, as, as you know, the, the people that, that you know, live there are. And so, yeah, rather than, than, than actually dealing with, with the problems, you, know, you, you sort of, I guess, are taught to, to, to be brave and suppress them and you know, take drugs in order to, to not think about the things that you're doing. And in fact, a lot of the times um, during people's recovery from, from substance, especially in their kind of like rehabilitation from the gang or their disengagement from the gang, um, a lot of these, these kind of like past traumas bubble over to the surface. Now you're left with a situation where, you know, you're, you're fending for yourself um, in, in a context that doesn't valorize hardness, but valorizes something less emotional, and you don't really have the mechanisms to deal with that. And so you do have, to some extent, some counseling services that are uh, available. A lot of it is done through churches. Um, and so you have communities of faith that, that offer sort of their own form of social and, and psychosocial support. Um, some of the research I've done on disengagement, like scripture and, and sort of that religious community serves a, a really important function. So you know, people kept talking about their faith, either, you know, Islam or, or Christianity. And, you know, I'm not a religious person. So I, I always tried to, to kind of like, how do I make sense of this in a way that, that I sort of see it? And the way that I started to, to kind of understand it is that, you know, in the same way that the gangster is a repertoire, there's a number of repertoires that are available to people that are trying to get out of gangs. The religious repertoire is, is one of those. Um, and so rather than like baggy pants, and people would say this, like, I don't wear baggy pants anymore. I don't like cut my hair a particular way, I don't have big jewelry, I've got my slacks, my nice shoes and my shirt. And that kind of projects to the world and to myself that I'm a different person, right? And not only is that like a, um, a social performance, it's also a, you know, a performance of, of like, a breaking from your past and a, a source of absolution. So it's actually really important in that rehabilitation process and added to that is, you know, an ideology that allows for that absolution, a rebirth. You know, a lot of people are born again Christians. And so you don't see, at least I haven't encountered, although I haven't studied it, um, just because there, there, there are so many people going through, through this kind of pipeline um, and there are so few resources available at the community level, oftentimes it's done informally, right? And, and religion plays a, a huge role in that. I mean, I, I think we should mention that, you know, despite that, that gangs in, in colored communities sort of get so much sort of notoriety. There, as I said, is an estimated 100,000 sort of members in the Western Cape. Most of them, I would imagine, are, are in colored communities. But just to give you a sense of how big Cape Town is, Cape Town is, is you know, 4 million people. And so it's not that everybody is influenced by, by what they see on the corner and, and you know, everybody experiences in those, in most township communities, some form of oppression in, in, you know, in their own way, but they react to it in, in different ways, right? It's just that gangs have an outside, an outsized effect on their communities through kind of their projections of success. Um, yeah, how notorious they are, how much power they have, and also the effects that they have on their community, right? And so going back to, to one of the comments that, that you made, Lorena, like about choices, right? Some of the things that, that, you know, I find really sad is that, although like I would never condone being in, in a gang and, and acting violently, you do see why people make that choice when what they return to is, you know, they're now out of the gang and sure they have a sense of security and, and maybe a re-engagement with the family, but oftentimes not, a, they don't have a job. They're still, you know, threatened. They're seen as weak in their community. Um, if they are able to get a job, it's, it's oftentimes as a cleaner for, for like a, a pittance, um, and so you see why there is a percentage of people that would make that choice, right? Because the other choice is, you know, living sort of a, a decent life according to the standards of your community, which, you know, by all measures, I think is, is, is you know, still quite difficult, right? Um, and then, sorry, the other one was, was about gangs providing services. So just very quickly, I mean, one, one of the things that I tried to get across is, you know, the gangs are, are obviously, 
a, a reaction to tough circumstances, right? And so where the, fates, the state fails to provide um, basic services, some form of governance, policing, gangs step in, and they have their own sort of, you know, kangaroo courts in a way. Um, I was speaking to a group of Americans, um, which is a gang here, uh, two days ago, and they said, you know, if something happens where somebody gets robbed in this area of the community, people will come here and we'll figure out who it is and they'll be punished, right? And of course, you know, on the other hand, they are the ones that are committing different types of violence as well, but, you know, this is seen as, as a benefit in some ways to the community, also giving out loans, obviously with strings attached, but for people that are trapped in poverty and might not be able to make it to the next meal, you know, that is, again, also a type of service, right? As opposed to, you know, an economy that doesn't exist for the most part, a police force that drives through and reacts but doesn't do any preventative policing, um, if that's even a thing really. So yeah, there, there, there are, if not community services, at least like important roles um, that gangs play in filling the sort of the, the gaps in governance and development. Thank you for that. Um, Ibrahim, I have a question for you from the comment box. Um, it says that you talked about how gangs are present in schools. Do you also see gang presence in the police? Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that. And I also have another question. Um, I'm wondering if in Sierra Leone there is a culture of prison gangs. And if so, does the flow into street gang culture in the way that it does in Cape Town? So I think if we answer those two and then we can do final comments. Well, I'll answer the first one and we'll pass the second one to Kiri. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, you don't only find gang members in the police, you find them in the military. You also find them in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the correctional centers as prison officers. Now, the lower rank in the police, in the military and in the prison uh, services, I'm afraid they are recruited and they participate in the very culture that valorizes gangsterism. I'll give you concrete examples. Um, you could go to any correctional center in Sierra Leone. It's incredible, but prisoners or inmates have access to marijuana. How do they do that? Of course, they get it through prison officers. They get access to cell phones. How do you explain that? You know, so um, there is a link in terms of what goes in, in and out. And you go to the military, it's the same thing. But right now, there is a phenomenon that emerged almost at the same time when we had the regime change. Now you have a group of soldiers who have constituted themselves into a gang. They call them soldier team, soldier team. Quote unquote, they are supposedly repping green. That's the color. You will say green is the military color, but green is also the color of the party in power. So, and these are people who they engage in everything that gangsters are engaging from criminality to the non-criminal, they sell marijuana, they consume marijuana, they sell hard drugs, they consume hard drugs, and they have a space where they rendezvous 24 hours. So um, if you go to the barracks, you see the, the gangster the life thriving in some of them. So to begin to draw a line that, oh, no, the police are different, no, I don't think so. It's about not having a professional force. And it's about kids growing in a particular neighborhood and some having access or connections so that they get into those institutions. But they are not insulated from gang culture. No, they're not. I doubt it. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, Kieran, I think I'll leave the last question that I asked to you. Maybe you might be able to shed some light on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Lorena. Um, th that's the one on prisons, right? Um, yeah, it's it's a really important question. Um, and in the research that, that me and Ibrahim have been doing in, in, in Sierra Leone, we were looking at a couple of areas. We wanted to find out what the trajectory is, because this is still early stages. It's not at the level of Cape Town, but there's potential for things to escalate. One of the things, as Ibrahim was talking about, is, is the presence in schools. Another thing we want to look at is prisons, I and mean, precisely because I, you know, I've done research in Cape Town and Rio, and, and Ibrahim has done research where we've seen that being an issue in other, in other cities. And it's different to the way the question was put, do we see prison gangs and how does that flow out onto the, onto the streets and affect street gangs? What, what we think we're seeing is the other way around, that there weren't really prison gangs, certainly not for the, um, the lifers have their own little associations, but for the most, most prisoners, no. But the street gangs are flowing into the prisons. Um, and we actually went and we did interviews in Pedemba Road Prison shortly be before it made international headlines, actually, when there was uh, violence supposedly involving some of the gang members we interviewed. Um, and we also went to um, a, a couple of regional facilities, one maximum security and one uh, low security. And we interviewed, um, we formally interviewed prisoners who were gang members, some not gang members. And we also kind of, you know, through our casual observations, had conversations with prison officers. And it was clear that, first of all, a large percentage, I couldn't give you an exact figure, but a very large percentage of the prison population of the young male population were in cliques. And those that weren't had good reasons to join, um, increasingly they're separating the prison population by gang allegiance, just to stop them from having you know, disputes, taking the beef that's out on the streets into the prison yard, so keeping them apart. But that obviously then means if you want to be secure and safe, just as Darius mentioned with the prison gangs, you probably need to pick a side. And there's another benefit. As a lot of unfortunately young Sierra Leone offenders know, there's not going to be a rehabilitation program. It's not like when you come out of prison, you've learned a skill or there's someone going to look after you and you know, provide ongoing support in the main. Um, so what you need to do is think about what you do when you get out. And if you don't have job opportunities and you don't have the will or the, the, the belief that you can change, you build your connections for, for further crime, really. Um, and so a lot of the guys that we interviewed said it's a great networking place. So the prisons are acting like a networking hub for the gangs. People are joining they might have gone in prison for a minor infraction, smoking weed, and then they choose to join a gang because of the contacts they get. They come out on the street. Now they have all of these friends through their, their fellow gangs from inside, and now they're part of the gang, and it's growing that way. Um, and the other effect that it's had is it's, it's making it grow um, in, a, in a more national spread quicker. Now, the gangs are actually already all over Sierra Leone, um, but it's mixing things up further because of the, the sheer overcrowding in the, in the main prisons is so severe, and that was seen in the Pedember incident, that they often transport the prisoners to different regional facilities. And so you might be in Freetown, you might be in Kenema, and they will send you to the other side of the country. And so you had gangsters who were both bloods or both crips or from the black gang, but meeting for the first time and building their connections, building a national network, um, so the prisons are a real challenge. They don't, they're not a different gang. They're not prison gang. You have the street gangs in the prisons. Um, and the real concern is you have a lot of those senior gangsters now um, in their early 30s, for the most part, the most senior, who are in for a long time. Um, but that's still their street capital. What Darius was talking about is their gang membership. So they're setting up their little kingdoms um, as they should do in the prisons. Um, and if they become institutionalized, then you know, what's going to happen. And we talk about it. it's not lack of rehabilitation. You're actually going into a gang conversion um, program. You just don't know it and you're going to be converted into a gangster. Um, so that's, that's a real problem. Thank you so much, Kieran. I just want to offer some final comments in the last five minutes. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation and it's also kind of stirred up a lot of questions for me as well in terms of youth marginalization in that sense, in terms of what are the leadership dynamics that come into play when actually understanding this and how do you think about the exchange of influence? Who are people influenced by? Also this idea of in order to look globally, you have to look locally in that sense because the context is very different in very different places. So, and in that case, the ability in terms of security, living long and living well in that sense, if we take it as that, what are you seeing? And what, how does that drive them 
in relation to this topic. So I think that's really, really important and some of the main kind of questions I'm taking out of this conversation. I don't know if you want to offer some final comments in the last five minutes before we close. I, 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 I mean, I, hopefully Ibrahim and Darius will say something. I just wanted to say um, thanks to Ibrahim and Darius for for their for their their comments. Um, and um, yeah, I think I wasn't expecting actually such a nice synergy between what you both had to say. But it was, you know, I mean, perhaps partly by design. But um, I just thought it was really great. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks both. I was just going to say, I mean, Darius, have you never thought about? Looking at what is happening in Jobag, I mean, no, I mean, no robust comparison has been done within South Africa uh, itself. I mean, that is not too helpful. Everything you read is Cape Town, hard living Americans have been privileged. But uh, I mean, if you compare the stats in terms of people dying in Cape Town and Jobag, they are almost, comp I mean, they say on a par. So why would you privilege the one? And and people are just silent about what is happening in, in, in Johannesburg area. I, I don't understand that. Every gang, gang researcher that goes to South Africa goes to Cape Town. And gangs are all over South Africa. Yeah, but we come here for the wine. <laughs> <laughs> our, our motives are, are far less altruistic than, than you make them out to be. No, but it's, it's a good point. And I think, yeah, the, so, so to your point, but, but kind of away from your point, I think that the starting point is to, to make the comparison here, right? Because what we're talking about is, is yeah, like this, this monopolization of research in particular communities in Cape Town, but there's not even a need to go to Joburg because they are adjacent communities that have similar experiences with marginalization, but different experiences, um, different cultural backgrounds, different sort of, you know, um, racial compositions and how they're situated within the social order of, of this city and the country. And I think that direct comparison is, is much easier to make. And so, you know, unfortunately I've, I've, I've kind of gotten caught up that there's so much to write about from, from what I've managed to source from, from the research that I've done that I haven't been able to look at that very much. But there are sort of the beginnings of, of a research project that will hopefully go forward in the next year or so that looks at a comparison between um, black communities and, and colored communities. And so um, hopefully th there'll be some more answers should we have a, a similar discussion in a year. And then Joburg is next after that, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darius. <laughs> what is happening in Kailisha, et cetera. I mean, it's yeah. not... It's not to the level of what is happening in, in Jobak. And in fact, the history of gangsters in South Africa starts with the Rand area, Jobak area. What happened in Cape, Cape Town kicks off in the 30s with Scullies and the Pipes, et cetera. So how would you, I don't know. I mean, I lived in Cape Town for four years and I, I, I always raise that question. Nobody seems to have an answer for it. Maybe well, you should come back and we'll collaborate. <laughs> I think that's a good note to leave it on. <laughs> Great. I want to thank everyone for attending. And it's been a pleasure sharing a space with everyone on this screen. Um, please do look at our final Africa Week events tomorrow taking place. We have the Africa Research Forum 2020. And we also have an interesting discussion around security transformation, youth and leadership in relation to the NSARS movement. So hopefully that will proved to be a really interesting conversation as well. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening and I want to say thank you again for all attending.